Hey guys, welcome to DDC live for December 17th, 2021. We are excited to have Larry O'Connor with us today. Larry, how's it going? It's always good to see you. Yeah, we're moving along. Yeah, good, good to be here, George. So I suspect you're ready for the holidays. How's the family? Yeah, we're, we're all staying healthy and, you know, just looking forward to seeing this vaccine get out there and, you know, a, a new a path to normalization, hopefully over the next few months. And how's the OWC family? You know, our team has been, you know, doing great. You know, we did put a, a big portion of our, uh, our team over to work from home. But the uh, operation of Woodstock, which I mean, where we're manufacturing, you know, shipping, receiving, you know, some of the things that we just can't do remote, that team is, you know, it has done real well this year. We've had really exceptional safety protocols in place. I mean, we got them in place in early March and it's, it's worked out well so far. You know, so good. I mean, people's safety is, and their health is paramount and first and foremost on top of everything else we're doing. And I'm, I'm just really thankful that we've been able to continue operations and been able to take care of customers and for the most part, keep things you know, on, a, on a steady pace this year. So OWC has uh, been pretty busy this year. Um, how are you feeling? I know you just got a few awards. You want us to tell, tell us about it? It's pretty cool. We, we, you know, it's, you know, honestly, <laughs> I, I don't like to talk about the awards because you know, it's really, you know, really glad that, again, appreciative and thankful that we have the team that we have, the customers that we have, and you know, we're able to do the things that are making a difference out there. So it's nice to be recognized in products and, and other areas, but it's really you know, about the team we've got and, and taking care of our customers. Try not to I try not to dwell on the. Uh, it's, it's nice to have recognition, but you know we need to continue earning that recognition and, and our customers trust every day. I mean, it's it's good to hear you say that. I know sometimes it's, it's you don't want the awards, but um, we, we're as a company we're proud of we're proud of you guys. You know, not because I'm an end user, but obviously, you know, you a big contribution to the. Mac community, now the PC community, now the creative community. So the accolades are well deserved. You guys have been pretty busy. I yeah, appreciate that. And well, we're looking forward to virtual CES where we can you know, show off some products we've been able to talk about and, and more yet to come. So now, do you see yourself going to CES? Is that going to be a virtual situation or is it going to be live? Uh, C uh, CES is virtual. It's it's already uh, it's it's all set up as a. It, it's going to be interesting. Well, uh, how are you feeling about that? I mean, we're going to get into what we're here to talk about soon because you've been all involved with a lot of virtuals in the past eight months. You did a, a lot with FMC. You've, you've been busy. What is your take on it? How do you see our industry coming back? You know, we have CS supposed to start in January and then, you know, we roll into NAB. Obviously, NAB is not happening in April. So... What is your outlook on where we go from here? As a company, you're used to going and having these massive boots and displays. How do you see us moving forward? You know, we're doing more with you know, our partners, you know, the brick and mortar. I mean, different, you know, more localized events, which are safer and, you know, and also easier to, you know, really have an impact. But, you know, the big events, I mean, any opportunity to interface with customers is still pretty, pretty important. I mean, that's where we, you know, Make sure we're on the right track. Get ideas for solutions in terms of you know what, you know where the gaps are and different workflow needs. So I, I do hope you know it's not going to be 2021, but certainly 2022 we see you know, some reshaping of these kinds of events where people can come together. I mean nothing beats you know the get together and, and talk to people face to face. The virtual stuff is you know it's it's been it's been fun. I mean it's been good. It's you know, it provides you know some of that, but you you just don't you, you don't get the uh, you know, the, the kind of interactions you do when you can bump into somebody and strike up a conversation and, and have it go to places that weren't expected. I mean, I'm, with the virtual, everybody's kind of in the same room and you know, all can, it, it's different. So I'm, I'm glad we have the, the work from home technology, the remote technology, all this virtualization that's made, you know, communication you know, possible on a pretty good level this year, but it still doesn't, it still doesn't uh, you know, match up to that in-person opportunity. Well, obviously, this could be a, 
a whole conversation by itself and we have it every day with you know on office hours with Alex Lindsay so we're constantly trying to figure out what's going to happen next so let's um let's talk about I, hope, I mean not to even interject I, I hope it gets back on I mean there's a lot of people depend on I mean that's a lot of people's jobs are you know surround that whole expo that whole interaction you know in-person kind of gig so you know I, I do hope for everybody's sake it we get back we got to get back out there sooner than later i mean i, I agree with you that's the, the the av production industry i i happen to work in the production and av industry so my colleagues definitely we're hurting right now you know i've been lucky to be able to operate in this virtual space and still make a living but there's folks that pretty much are not working right now for the past eight months you know so i i hope too that we get back to a place where everyone could get out and work well Go Pfizer, go Moderna, go, go all these guys and you know, see these vaccines make a difference. And, and just honestly, right now, we just need people to be patient. Now stick to the, you know, the protocols. And hopefully, again, this will be beyond you know, in the past sooner than sooner than later. But it's tough. I mean, it's just it's it's, it's I know it's really tough. It, it's something that's countered everything you know, we're used to doing. But it, we're so close. Yeah, I agree, and um, ho hopefully it will get better. So let's um, let's dig into Thunderbolt. There's there's questions I have for you. Um, before we jump into four, let's step back a, a, a week ago around it because there's still even though Thunderbolt three has been out for a while, I still have questions because obviously um, I have a 2020 2018 MacBook Pro that had have four Thunderbolt ports. Can you break it down for us? What exactly are those independent ports? Are we using it, it? Explain, explain it to me, please. Exactly, the bandwidth control and so forth about all these Thunderbolt ports. Sure, on the the Mac Pro, on the MacBook Pros with four ports, you've got two Thunderbolt controllers in that machine. So there's a technically a total of eighty gigabits of bandwidth between you know the the, uh, the, the two sides of the machine. Each each side has you know its own controller and can support up to forty gigabits, including what's allocated to display. So with SoftRaid, for example, you can raid, you know, two separate Thunder Bays, you know, across two ports, the, on each, one port on each side of that machine and potentially, you know, get over 4,000 megabytes a second of real sustained bandwidth. But you have two controllers, but in, you know, two ports, one controller. You never, you don't have any, anything that's more than uh, on a host, on a host computer, uh, any, uh, any case where there's more than uh, two ports, it's, it's always one controller. You know, for for at least every two ports. Now, when we're setting up, let's let's say I edit suite, and maybe we have a couple of different Thunderbolt devices. How should we separate them out? Well, putting a high resolution display on a port is going to take a, a chunk of bandwidth. In fact, you, know, you add that to a, a chain with data. Depending on what that display is, it can take a, a lot of your uh, bandwidth. And that also has to do with the cabling and other things. I mean, ideally, you split your high bandwidth devices between the two ports. Now, if you're not using them simultaneously, it's not you know, such a big deal. But if you're doing simultaneous access between devices, or you have a display and, you, and then a high bandwidth, like a, a Thunderblade, you know, something of that nature that you're using, ideally, you have the display on one side and have the uh, have the Thunderblade on the other side. You know, that display can take up, you know, you already have 12 gigabits uh, that's allocated to it, which is fine. So the other 28 for data always. Well, let me rephrase that. Out of the 40 gigabits, you've always got 12 gigabits uh, on, a, on a Mac, you know, 40 gigabit port that's allocated for display port. But higher resolution displays, 5K, 6K displays can actually use more than that 12 gigabits and, and take your performance down lower. So how about when Does we... that make sense? It, it does. So... What happens when we put an eGPU into the mix? eGPU needs all the bandwidth that is available to it. And eGPU, you know, you're putting it on a dedicated port. So ideally, uh, you know, it's on, again, it's on its own dedicated controller. You don't have to, but it's going to suck up a lot of the bandwidth that, that Thunderbolt has to offer. Okay, so let's step forward now to Apple's newly released lineup of M1 chip, because there's a pretty good mm -hmm. uh, good article on your website of when your colleagues wrote. Now, I'm not going to get into the Facebook comments on Facebook, but obviously there's some dis people are always going to disagree about when somebody writes something. So how is the two ports on the M1 Mac Mini being utilized? Because 
I, I'm, I'm hearing it might, you might be get more use out of that. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we're seeing more performance across a single control than technically uh, should be possible. You know, Apple is the first, uh, well, actually, technically they're the second vendor to deploy uh, their own Thunderbolt solution. I mean, uh, the, the Thunderbolt technology now for doing Thunderbolt host chipsets is open source until did this uh, a bit over a year ago so that to encourage you know, more use of Thunderbolt. And you, know, you have AMD actually has Thunderbolt now and some systems that they got certified uh, back in either February or, more, or March of uh, this year. And now Apple is the first to, I should say the second after AMD to deploy a machine, deploy actually three different systems with their own Thunderbolt uh, silicon solution. So whatever Apple's doing, it's, it's definitely giving a little bit different. We're seeing less performance on a single port, but we're seeing more performance when we aggregate two ports than technically should be. Well, let me take a step back then, you know, typically would be expected uh, from other Thunderbolt uh, interfaces. All right. So I like what Apple's in. doing in general. And I, I do like Apple's implementation overall, and it's not going to complain. I, I think if you are Apple fanboy, fan girl, fan man, fan woman, you're going to love what they're doing. Then you're going to have those are not going to love what you're doing and they're going to blast it. But I am definitely excited about a 16 inch MacBook Pro with M1 chip inside of it or M whatever it's going to be. So let's jump into Thunderbolt 4 because obviously you see all the questions. There's a reason that you're out there. I, I saw the video pieces that you put out. There's your, the article on your blog. So let's jump into Thunderbolt 4. What, what versus 3, how is it different and so forth? You know, it's it's simple. But it's complicated. It's really simple at the core, but every time I try to explain it, I, I find myself you know, taking far too many words and spending way too much time to explain what really, in my head and my understanding, it, it should be very simple. But you know, Thunderbolt 4, you know, first and foremost, you know, is, a, is a set of standards. And as a set of standards, you know, especially on the PC side, that means really for the first time when you buy a Thunderbolt PC, if it's Thunderbolt 4, you know all the features that Thunderbolt has to offer are present. Now, what they also did with Thunderbolt 4 is add in some requirements related to USB, as well as requirements for video. So on a Windows PC with Thunderbolt 4, not only does it mean you have everything that Thunderbolt 3 promised you have to have, these are things that Thunderbolt is capable of, but weren't always implemented on different PCs with Thunderbolt 3. I mean, I, I kind of covered that in the blog. You know, cover that in that that piece. I mean, there's it, it's a, it's a real I hate to say it a hodgepodge on the Windows side with what it means if that if you buy a machine that had Thunderbolt three. It might only be twenty gigabits. It might support power delivery. It might not. You know, it it, it it's it's just it's a it may support video. It may uh, you know, the two four Ks. It might not. There's also it might have the the DMA protection. It might not. There's all these things that Apple has always provided and had standard. Apple's always implemented the full capability set of Thunderbolt 3, no matter what Mac you bought, as opposed to a Windows machine that may or may not have various features. Thunderbolt 4, on the other hand, you get everything that Thunderbolt 3 always promised would be there, and they tack on the requirement for the on the host side that you can also do two, two uh, 4K displays or a single 8K display you know, via that Thunderbolt uh, 4 interface. So that's a guaranteed standard. So you know it's 40 gigabits, you know it will support displays, it has to support power delivery if it's a laptop. These features are absolutely standard. There's no looking at the fine print to know what exactly that PC can do over Thunderbolt. It has everything that Thunderbolt promises. On the Apple side, it gets a little more, it's not so much complicated, it's still pretty simple. Now we already had everything for the most part that Thunderbolt 4 is now promising is present on the PC. Apple doesn't support 8K displays yet. They support up to 6K. So we don't have 8K support. You know, technically we're not Thunderbolt 4 on that basis. But our Thunderbolt 3 ports support Thunderbolt 4 peripherals. Now give us, you know, the full capabilities that, that Thunderbolt 4 effectively promises. And then the only other caveat is now with the M1 Max, Every other Apple Mac out there 
with Thunderbolt 3 ports can support two external 4K displays via those Thunderbolt 3 ports. In the case of the new M1 Max, now they only have a, the way that they're implemented, you know, they're only able to support via standard Thunderbolt a single 4K display. So also in that respect, you know, people would argue, well, that's not Thunderbolt 4. But Thunderbolt 4, and now we're talking about the host side, you know, really is Thunderbolt 3. I mean, it's, it's really not, you know, different than Thunderbolt 3. I mean, you have effectively two Thunderbolt 3 40 gigabit ports. But again, this is, I'm, I'm trying not to, uh, you know, over confuse here, but more than anything else, it, it really does clean up windows by telling you those Thunderbolt 4 ports give you everything you're supposed to have that Thunderbolt 3 could have been giving you, you know, for the last you know, few years. In fact, even uh, in the case of AK Video, Titan Ridge brought on support for a, for a Display Port 1.4 and, and AK. So it's, it's not there really aren't new Thunderbolt 3 features being added, other than a PC with Thunderbolt 4. Has to has to have the full Thunderbolt implementation, you know, no, you know, partial implementations, and also has to have the internal support for you know the two four Ks or eight K video. Now we can talk about the device side. The devices are a little bit different, but it's and again, it's a real positive. Actually, the most positive thing talk about a Thunderbolt four device. Once again, Thund Apple has already with eleven dot one Big Sur. Any Apple machine that has Thunderbolt 3 ports has full support of the Thunderbolt 4 hubbing, which was the main peripheral edition that's been, marked, that's been marketed under the Thunderbolt 4 name. Now, Thunderbolt 4 peripherals also have the requirement of effectively being universally compatible with the USB Type-C. So US computers that don't have Thunderbolt, you now technically our Thunderbolt hub, our Thunderbolt dock, can connect to and they'll operate in compatibility mode where those Thunderbolt ports operate as USB ports and you effectively have a, a USB-C hub and other USB functionality. And that's wonderful, but what truly is exciting with the Thunderbolt 4 badge and, and requirement on the on the, uh, the non-host side are with the cables. You know, the USB-C cables are a huge mess. Thunderbolt 3 cables can be a little bit confusing because you have active and passive, you have you, know, you have 20 gigabit and 40 gigabit, depending on the passive side, depending upon what the length is. And you, know, you, you the bottom line is you you know not every cable gives you the same you know, capability. Thunderbolt cables are backwards compatible with USB-C, but Thunderbolt 4 cables, no matter what length of cable you buy, a Thunderbolt 4 cable will always connect between two USB-C devices at the maximum bandwidth and capability possible. So whether you use it with a USB-C dock, you know, a Thunderbolt 3 device, you, know, you want to use it for power, you're using it with a, a Thunderbolt 40 gigabit device, you're using it now from your computer to a Type-C display, a Thunderbolt 4 cable will always work. All Thunderbolt cables, you know, let me rephrase. Let me let me clarify. All Thunderbolt 3 and Thunderbolt 4 cables have always been 100 watts certified. So the maximum PD that's allowed over a cable, anything that's Thunderbolt is certified to support that. USB cables are a whole different story. And the thing about a USB cable, you know, and I see them in the store, they say they're 60 watts or they're 30 watts, but nothing on the cable tells you, you know, what watt is that that cable is rated for. Nothing on the cable tells you that it's a, it can be used for data or not. You know, one of the biggest problems we have you know, in, in tech support with Type-C cables are, are actually with the Apple cables that are included with their laptops. And not because Apple's done anything wrong. It's a Type-C cable that Apple provided for going from your laptop to your power adapter to power the computer. It was not intended for data. And folks will use that cable to connect a USB-C dock and it will partially work, but not all the way, which of course leads to troubleshooting and geez, why is you know, this port not working, but that one works. And well, the reality is that cable only provides USB 2 data rates. It's not rated for, which is the minimum. All USB-C cables that are certified are supposed to support at least USB 2, you know, 40 megabits. But a Type-C dock that's supposed to be 10 gigabits only getting a USB 2 connection is, you know, it certainly doesn't have enough bandwidth to do video and, and a lot of other things. And of course you plug that same cable into a Thunderbolt device and it does nothing. 
and people assume what's well, an Apple cable. Apple makes great stuff. I mean, this is and it's high quality. That's something I just want to say in general. I saw this in a forum a few days ago. You know, somebody talked to, and I won't name the brand, but they said, you know, what a nice cable this was. I mean, it was high quality, built really nice. I, I, it, it must, it can't be the cable that's my problem. And as somebody who's personally tested a lot of different video cables, you know, let alone you know looking at the difference between you know, USB-C cables and the risk you have with the USB-C cables. In general, I mean, I, I really buy from a brand you trust and know because you know, you're, you're things that can carry power, especially if they're not you know, properly certified and tested to carry the power. I mean, it, it, there's real risk there. But back to the cables, some of the nicest looking cables that I tested, you know, gave me you know, artifacts or worse in terms of the display connection, as opposed to you know some of the you know, I would have thought, wow, this is looks like a really cheaply made cable, and it worked great. So I'm not suggesting buy you know cheaply made you know cables, but just because a cable looks great doesn't mean that you know what's inside you know there's impedance. I mean there's there's more to just having a heavy cable you know to transmit your data. So I kind of get all over the place. But going back to Thunderbolt four, when you buy our Thunderbolt four cables, where they will say TV four and forty gigabits, you will never have a problem. And I, it's really been fun listening to the folks who say, "Well, I'm just going to cut all my other cables in half, so I never grab the wrong cable again." And, and that's the truth. But if you buy Thunderbolt four cables for your Type C connectivity, you never have to even think about what you're plugging in because if it's Type C on both ends, it doesn't matter. It's just going to work. So let me ask you a quick question. So you made a point. OWC made a point. Your cables. I mean, I go through here sometimes. I have OWC regular. USB C cables, and then I have Thunderbolt 3 cables. It's labeled 3, so that's that. Obviously, that's Thunderbolt 3. Um, also, are you going to be coming out of Thunderbolt 4, Thunderbolt 4 cables in the near future? Yeah, we should begin shipping our Thunderbolt 4 cables in early uh, 2021. I mean, right now we're shipping with our dock and our, uh, our hub, but the uh, individual cable availability will be uh, early next year. Now, all of our USB-C cables are fully certified. We only did 100 watt cables. We never did the, the lower power cables. And again, they're all e-marked. You know, and that's why I say, I mean, look, I hope you buy our cables, but in general, I, I really recommend don't buy the cheap generic cables. I mean, if they're not certified, if they're not e-marked, if they're not rated for you know 100 watts, there's nothing to stop you from using those cables with devices that actually will pull that power and they're just simply not safe. Well, I guess my rule is if you're working for a paying client, buy the real cables or make sure you're buying repertoire of cables to use with your system. Um, let's talk about your Thunderbolt 4 dock, because this is interesting. Um, obviously, with Thunderbolt 3, we have been daisy changing everything. Now, what does the Thunderbolt 4 dock represent? Is this a true dock where you could just plug in on different devices and just keep on daisy chaining with Thunderbolt 4? Certainly, actually, we have a Thunderbolt uh, for we have a Thunderbolt hub and a, a new Thunderbolt four dock. I'm both sorry, yes, include... I meant the, I meant the hub. Sure. Well, we have both. The, the, we have a dock now with that gives you additional uh, Thunderbolt ports as well as a, a hub that's, that gives you a USB port and otherwise again gives you additional uh, Thunderbolt ports. But for the first time, you can plug in you know, your this Thunderbolt device into one Thunderbolt port. It's any any Thunderbolt Type C port, Thunderbolt three port, or on a PC Thunderbolt four. A PC, but on a Mac, any Mac from 2016 or later with Thunderbolt 3, plug it in, and now you go from you know that one port gives you three you can connect devices to, and a USB port you know for you know, for grins, and then we have our dock which gives you a host of other uh, con additional connectivity, including Ethernet and, and USB ports and video, and also gives you uh, three Thunderbolt uh, ports, Thunderbolt 3 slash I come they're really Thunderbolt 3 ports, but they're I guess you call it Thunderbolt 3, call it Thunderbolt 4. Yeah, Thunderbolt 4 is more a marketing position than a new technology. It's, it tells you what a device is supposed to be able to do. So technically, they're, I like how Apple described it because Apple's latest implementation, you know, they technically didn't meet Thunderbolt 4 requirements because they don't support two 4K external displays or single 8K. That's probably the biggest thing. So Apple has just simply said we're Thunderbolt slash USB 4. And then you look at their specs under the hood, and their specs are you have two Thunderbolt 3 slash USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports. And USB 4 will also, I expect, I can't, I can't speak for Apple, but USB 4, I have no doubt, will be, will be supported by Apple in the future. You know, once USB 4 actually firms up. Right now, there's no devices uh, to utilize out there. And I caution people on USB 4 cables, you know, 
Whereas Thunderbolt is highly, you know, controlled in terms of the certifications and, you know, somebody, anybody be able to go out and start shipping a product, you know, for Thunderbolt with the Thunderbolt 4 name or Thunderbolt name in general, USB doesn't have those controls. And there's already f companies out there that have been shipping USB 4 cables. And the only issues we ran into uh, the testing on our dock had to do with early USB 4 cables that weren't working right with USB devices because they didn't have the approved USB 4 firmware. So companies just ship this stuff out there and those cables, I, they're not good. They're, they're junk. I mean, proper cables, you know, not a problem, but again, there's, you just don't have the control. When you buy the Thunderbolt 4 cables are just going to be a few dollars more than, uh, than USB-C. I mean, we're talking probably two or three bucks more and they're certified. And by being certified, they absolutely, they're going to work. You never had, there's just no guesswork. There's not, you know, it's not one of these things where it partially works. And is it the device? Is it the cable? You now they work. I mean, and for anybody in you know, mission, anybody who, whose livelihood depends on you know, the cable they're using or what that cable is connected to time, you just can't replace. And I, I am really appreciative until, you know, putting that Thunderbolt, moving the cables to a Thunderbolt 4 designation. And at that point, stabilizing to where every Thunderbolt 4 cable is going to meet the specification. Thunderbolt 3 is sort of there. I mean, cables that are you know, under uh, 0.8 meters by, will do work at full bandwidth for USB 3.1 and, and, and USB 3.2, as well as all Thunderbolt. But then you get into the one meter and longer cables that are either passive and 20 gigabits or they're active. You know, for longer lengths, which aren't that much longer. And unfortunately, a, an active Thunderbolt cable, just like you know, some of the USB-C cables that are just for power, they only provide USB 2 speeds if you use them to connect to USB 2 device. I, could, I mean, it's, I can just go around and around in circles on this stuff. But you buy a Thunderbolt 4 cable, if it's Type-C on both ends in terms of the host you're connecting to and the device you're connecting to, you don't even have to think you know twice about it, it it's going to work no matter what the two devices are they're type c the type c it, it always works with so thunderbolt me, 4. so there's a question i have for you because I've, I've seen this come a couple of times and it's it's happened to me a few times here obviously i have one of your products on my desk and it also powers my macbook pro but there is times when my battery just stops charging and I don't know if it's the dock that's not charging it anymore, or is that because there's such a, a drain on all the Thunderbolt devices I'm using? Just, a cur just curious. Yeah, the Thunderbolt Pro Dock, uh, it, it, which was a, originally an Akedia product that we brought over, it's a great product that has the CFast reader and the, the eSATAs, those USB ports and video. It provides 60 watts of PD. So if you're under a heavy load, especially you've got bus powered devices on your computer, you know, it is possible for the computer to be using you know, more than the, the 60 watts that provides. And while the draw is higher than 60 watts, it's gonna, it's gonna stop the charging on your battery and use it just for the processor and the GPU and everything else that's going, going on. Fortunately, they have so, a pretty hefty battery. So for a person that's in my position. That doesn't mean everything you know, comes to a, to a stop, but nonetheless. I know, but I, I constantly have to keep an eye on that. So for a person like me that ha do, does have a lot of things that's, drink, that's constantly on Zoom streaming like we're doing now, what other product do we have? Do you have on the chain that maybe I should go to, that would be able to maintain the charge? Sure, our 14 port dock and uh, I'd say our full on uh, our new Thunderbolt dock. I mean, those both provide. You know, actually the uh, the 14 port dock is 85 watts of charging. The uh, the new Thunderbolt dock that we just introduced uh, using Thunderbolt 4 technology currently supports 90 watts, which is a new uh, a new peak, you know, maximum that we can put out there. Both those will keep that computer. You, won't, you still won't always charge, especially on a MacBook Pro 16 inch. I mean, if it's at max, max draw, you'll keep that battery level. But nonetheless, it gives you a little more, a little more wiggle room. And again, most of the, the high wattage draw, they're peak draws. And once you're past peak, I mean, you should be back to charging. Now, you talked about, I think we mentioned that M1, you know, the future of M1, M1X and everything coming down the pike. It's going to be pretty amazing to see what Apple does in terms of you know the, the power consumption and the, the lack of probably the lack of heat and just amazing performance we're going to see in far more efficient uh, Apple silicon based laptops in the future. So let, let's switch gears a little bit because um, there's things I want to touch on because obviously you know like I said I moved between the post production world and AV LTO. You've um, recently mm -hmm. launched 
a product. Uh, my good friends over at um, Imagine Products, we're using a little bit of their software to, for the LTO part of it. What made you, I mean, obviously you saw what creators were doing and, and you know, it's been great over the past couple, maybe a year or two now where you saw the, the, the a rise in creatives using OWC products. Why LTO now? You know, it took us, you know, we wanted to do it right. And we want to make sure that it's there for the future because things are changing, certainly with Apple's architecture and the support necessary for LTO to operate on Mac. And I don't just mean, you know, the Imagine software side, but also the, uh, the SaaS interface into the, uh, the system. But why now is we've had a lot of customers asking for it. You know, we do understand the need for it. The cost has come way down in terms of efficiency. I mean, it's a lot more practical to use LTO 8 today than it was a couple of years ago. So all those factors, you know, it was quite frankly, we should have done it sooner. You know, now was, you know, was at any time uh, at this point was the right time to get it out there and, and see customers support of it. But we spent a couple of years you know, developing that solution to make sure it was absolutely perfect. And it was released for Mac first. You know, Windows support is, is right around the corner. Um, Thunderblade. I was, again, you've, you've made inroads with the creative community and just providing solid gear for them to be able to, what is DIT, what is post-production. I actually have a ton of blade on the way here to give a good test into on another a project coming up. Has the ton of blade been successful? Are you happy with the, with, with the results or, you know, where it's, where it's going? I would have to say informatically uh, yes to that. You know, that was a solution that, you know, we were really excited about bringing forth, you know, you know, for VFX and, you know, and, and on the uh, on the go editing. And it's, you know, very much supporting those roles and found a, a huge role, a bigger role than, you know, we had anticipated or even you know, initially planned for in just a whole DIT and, 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 and data you know, transportation. I mean, it's a great product across the board. And I'd say it's exceeded expectations in terms of the applications that, that it's found. You know, really you know, been, been key in for folks. And the other place that's taking off, you know, as opposed to buying internal stores on you know, these different systems, it's extremely high speed external, external storage, it's quiet. And you know, even folks you know, in home and office settings are finding it is you know, a great way to have more capacity versus you know, spending more to have factory capacity that's locked into a machine. You know, Thunderblade is also becoming a real, a real solid desktop accessory because it's pretty much as fast as the internal storage but again, it can go anywhere. But I keep saying, but you know, initially you know, we didn't plan to ship it in a, a Pelican-like case, and, and that came to be because there was so much use in the uh, the DIT and, and the transportation of dailies that it, it made sense. It was a great way to ship it to and protect it. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite products, honestly. Um, excellent. So I'm kind of moving down important things that I've been hearing about that for creatives. So. Let's talk about Envoy Express um, and M2, because I'm curious about your take on this. I think the last conversation we had, I'm, I'm really, M2, how does that fit into the post-production for quick turnarounds with, with Envoy Express? Again, when it comes to whether well, there's data transportation, or even being able to do you know, editing on the road, you know, the M.2 drives have gotten so fast over the last couple of years, the cost has come way down. It's just extremely efficient you know, to be able to use M.2 based external solutions for you know, whether it's transporting data, you know, duplicating data, and even before transportation. I mean, yeah, you could use less expensive hard drives, but the time you save copying and duplicating to an SSD, M.2 based SSD solution, whether that's a higher capacity Thunderblade or even a single blade you know, Envoy Pro, it, it's, it's huge. And the other big a benefit, of course, there's no moving parts, nothing to be damaged in shipping. I mean, these the units themselves can be run over with the tank. We did run one over with a steamroller. You know, the drive survived the side, but the uh, it kind of did damage the case. It was a steamroller, of course, on a on a actually, and it was you know it was on a, it was on already paved and, and set surface. Maybe the paving hadn't been set yet, but these devices are you know, pretty much indestructible, and really as they need to be because the data is is priceless as being ship back and forth. And once again, time is, is something you can't replace. And the time you save using M.2 today and, and the cost you know, ratio, I mean, it's, they're, they're really not, not that much more expensive, relatively speaking, than drives are now. 
So it's it's really fantastic to have these different M.2 solutions you know, for folks to use. Um, let's move forward to Flex. That's a new product that seems to be getting a lot of buzz. What, what was what was you thinking? Because it's 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 a little mixture of different things. What was your thinking when you decided to embrace that product or bring it to market? You know, it is the center of, uh, it can, of anybody's workflow. I mean, it has everything you need, especially as a DIT person. I mean, you have the CFAST built into it. You have the, the different hub ports built in. You have a PCIe slot where you can add a, a, press, a video or audio processing card or a, a, a 10G Ethernet connection. You know, there's eight bays you can hot swap between. You know, those eight bays, uh, you know, for which support NVMe, so they use U.2 drives, SAS drives, or uh, you can plug in, you know, we have our new shuttles, which actually are just around the corner. I think we've already, we may have already done some talking on, but we have shuttle uh, solutions as well that let you put four NVMe's into a single uh, uh, flex bay. But the intent is they give you, you know, extreme flexibility with extreme performance and capability. So lots of storage, very high speed, but really something that can, can be designed right out of the gate for pretty much any workflow you know, that's out there and has the flexibility. You know, you, again, these bays aren't fixed. I mean, you can change it, update it, you know, reconfigure it in the future to meet you know, whatever needs you know, you know, may come to be. But what's kind of sweet about this product, and this is, again, it'll be first quarter next year, you know, you're effectively be able to put a, a, thunder, a thunder blade, the equivalent of a thunder blade in a single flex eight bay. So you have a high speed SSD array plus another seven hard drives for you know, the, the less, uh, well, I say the stuff that's not as speed dependent, you know, all in one rig. Um, it's, it's an exciting solution. And again, it's customer inspired and our intentions across all the products we bring out is to deliver well, what you need and, and with the flexibility to again, adjust to different needs as they evolve. We don't want really to have to buy and dispose of things. We want stuff that goes goes the distance. And Flex8, I think, is another certainly another solution that, that fits into that, you know, meets that definition and some. Now, who's it, who's it geared towards? Obviously, post-production folks. Any other industries you, you're looking that's circling around that particular device? You know, that was really designed for the video industry. I mean, that having said that, I mean, it certainly still works or... You know, there's hobbyists, and enthusiasts to buy it. I mean, there's a lot of capabilities in that box. So it's, it's really you know, up to the, uh, the user's imagination. But at the end of the day, I mean, it was, it was geared and, and, and designed and targeted, you know, the folks that well, don't want to have a bunch of devices, you know, when they can have, you know, one flexible unit that, that really can do, you know, most all. You know, I, I keep having to go back to this because I remember when, the, o, the OWC team surveyed folks at NAB look like what is credit what is credit looking for and I I am impressed by the march you made from maybe two or three years ago to now and you really delivering on products you know over the past eight months or so that if online events we've had and you've been on some of those I hear folks say I didn't know OWC makes this you know so it's interesting to see how you really embracing the creative community and really putting out things, products out there that, that is useful to the community. Um, where does OWC go from here? You know, we continue to crank it along and it, it all, I mean, obviously improving and updating and, and maintaining the solutions that we already have that are widely dependent upon. And I'd say the other you know, area you're going to see a lot of advanced for OWC will be based in the software realm. I mean, these solutions you know, exist and are, are really strongly uh, enhanced by the software that they ship with. And we haven't done, a, we really haven't put our software uh, on the stage like we've, you know, like our hardware is placed. But these devices don't exist without, you know, the kind of software that makes them function. Soft RAID is absolutely a huge part of, you know, what makes the RAIDs in, in every Thunder Bay, every, you know, Flex 8, you know, all these solutions, you know, really power up and go. I mean, they provide, the, obviously, the RAID capabilities, they provide data monitoring, you know, they're doing drive, you know, failure analysis, making sure that your data is safe, you know, email reporting, you know, that's all you know, part of that software rate engine, which is a, a core element. I mean, these solutions don't exist without that software. And you know, when you buy our docs and our hubs, you know, we have the OWC doc ejector, simple piece of software, but it's something that is really important for folks 
because you don't want to disconnect drives, especially without knowing that they've been properly dismounted from a Mac or a PC system. And just because you click eject you know, on the uh, on you know, one drive, if you miss a drive, you run the risk of corrupting. If the system doesn't let go of it, you know, which sometimes happens, just the way uh, system resources try to hold hold on to a volume that's been mounted. You could run into a problem and dock ejector you know will safely eject and let you know when something's got to be force ejected and safe even though it says force eject will safely do so so that you know you can disconnect your devices you know mac drive you know gives interoperability between macs and pcs if you, know, you want to if you need to access that on a pc which a lot of dit environments you have both macs and pcs we make it very easy to have that data go back and forth and soft rate, I mean, our big goal with soft rate is to see that become you know, truly interoperable between Macs and PCs. You know, we have soft rate now with RAID 0 and 1. It's in, you can actually download the beta and do uh, RAID 5 now on Windows. But it's for the first time you can take a, a, a volume, take a soft rate unit off a of Mac, plug it into your Windows box, and you've got full read-write access you know, to that system. So things like that are really where the, uh, how to say, where the future is going. We want... We want people to be, you know, focused on, you know, using whatever platform is best for their needs and focus on the creativity and, and the work that they need to get done on those platforms without having to think about the technology. You know, kind of what Thunderbolt, you know, the Thunderbolt 4 cable does for connecting things. You know, stuff just needs to plug in and work. And that's absolutely, you know, what all of our engineering, all of our efforts are driven towards. So I know you, you keep mentioning cables. Let, let me... So how, how, what kind of distance can we get out, let's say uh, 25 feet? I see, it seems like I can only find corning cables that could run excess $300 for 25 feet. You know, do we see on the boat four cables any cheaper? Are we gonna get them in those lengths? Um, have you shy away from making that length of cables or is it just maybe of a cost thing, you know, factor in not going with a longer cable? You, you make up to a, a six feet or one meter right now. You know, we did optical cables for a little while with Thunderbolt 2, and the problem with optical, uh, it, it is, this is not so much an issue today, but it was, you know, before, th there are devices out there that aren't built, uh, they, let's just say they're not built the way we build things. And when there's too much plastic on the device, you know, the optical cables, you know, need to be able to dissipate heat. And if you're connecting to some of the devices out there where there wasn't good heat dissipation, you effectively can burn out the, uh, you know, the optics and, and the cable. And optical cables are really expensive. And, you know, we learned our lesson with some stuff out there. I said, yeah, we're going to let Corning get with this. I mean, they're, you know, when we don't, you know, we have, we want to take care of our customers. I mean, that's, you know, an absolute. And we, we replace a lot of cables we shouldn't replace is what it ultimately came down to. So we've kind of steered clear. Now with Thunderbolt 4, you know, you're going to see cables, not immediately, but you know, within a short period of time, you know, certainly next year, hopefully the first half of next year, we'll be up to two meters in, in copper cabling with Thunderbolt 4. The expectation is within you know, the next couple of years, we'll be able to get the five meters, so about 25, you know, what, 27 foot, whatever, with, uh, again, with copper. So it'll be at a much better cost point and, and not depend upon optical. For the longer, for the longer cabling, you'll still see anything over that, that length. And for a while, certainly at least in the next year, it, anything over two meters, you're still gonna want Corning. And Corning makes great cables. And Thunderbolt 3, the devices, I mean, the technology's come along. The, the heat dissipation is not, such, not as big as the other. The failures have been, for the most part, eliminated. But it was just, it was a expensive area that we got into and ultimately we kind of said, yeah, this is, you know, we're gonna leave it to the, the optical cable makers. Mainly Corning, who again does a great job and and, and deserves, uh, I would say, the market that they have there. So my my last uh, tech question, and every time I see you, I'm going to ask you this question. You probably, I don't know what you're going to tell me, but OWC all, has all these products now. When are you going to make a device that's completely cloud driven? I want to be able to push to Backblaze with a OWC drive. That's, you know, that's all part of the, uh, how to say, the, the, the ongoing strategy. You're going you're gonna to see some interesting things over the next couple of years. You know, and absolutely, you know, a cloud component is part of the future in terms of enhancing the capabilities mm -hmm. and the functionality of all the locally based hardware that you've already got from OWC. I mean, that's certainly a big part of the, uh, the future. So it's, it's in the pipeline, it's coming. You're going to see some pretty exciting things on our Jupiter 
side as well. You're going to hear some pretty exciting announcements you know, in the next two, three weeks you know, around you know, that kind of device in general. Well, I, I would say for a small shop like mine, obviously the Jupiter is a little bit out, out of my reach. That's why I keep pressing to see when you know we're going to see small shops individual freelancers, DITs being able to get devices that going to have a connection to the cloud. If the one thing that COVID in the past eight months has done is move a lot of us into production in the cloud. You know, I do a lot of live streaming now and I'm sure. using, I'm spinning. I, I have always been this on this side of tech, but now I find myself learning things in OWS or just networking on the cloud that I've never thought I'll be embracing or thinking about. But I have machines running in the cloud right now, so you know that's that's almost where the future is going to be for some of us. A part of it is being to maintain and operate in, in the cloud. So it's good to know that you're kind of moving in that direction. We've got a, a substantial move there, and the one thing we want to make sure is that it, you know the value is there. You know, one thing about the cloud, and we're not naming names. I mean, the cloud was relatively speaking, it was pretty inexpensive a decade, 15, well, 12, 13 years ago when it started to come about. Today, when you really look at you know what you've paid for cloud services, they're expensive. You know, and let alone you know they you have issues and go down. There's you know our intent is to make sure the people own their data and have enhancements that the cloud provides. I mean, capabilities that the cloud enables as opposed to a dependency on the cloud because the cloud costs you a lot yeah. you know, over time. It, it adds up quickly, especially as you know, demands go up. Yeah. It's inexpensive you know, past, you know, to a certain scale, but it's, it explodes in cost you know, once you really you know, have, some, have needs that are up there. Well, that, whether it's processor speed, or I should say processing capability or storage you know, beyond a certain level. It's a well, great, I mean, yeah. again, for everything, it's a great supplement, it's a great enhancement, you know, to hopefully what you can still do locally. Yep. I, I definitely agree with you. I, I tell all my colleagues, you know, definitely spend some time with AWS. It's a lot because you spend late nights, sometimes four in the morning, trying to figure things out. But once you figure out how to get your data, it doesn't matter what you're doing in, in, on AWS, whether it's Google or AWS, once you figure out how things work, and there's nothing against, let's say, the Dropboxes or the cloud services of the world, but I kind of enjoy figuring out, building out a system on S3 that I don't have to pay, let's say, 12000 a year, and I could do it for 2000 with my own brain power. So, you know, it, it's definitely we have to embrace doing things on our own and and knowing what i think also knowing what these foundations are built on whether it's frame io again dropbox is good to get an understanding of what's under the hood you, you you're never going to know what's under owc's hood or anybody else's hood but at least know what technology is being used well, you might know what technology is under our hood because we're pretty we try to be open about that stuff in general but Nonetheless, you know, be familiar with the technology and the service provider and, and what you're really paying for. Yeah. Because you can pay a lot for, you can pay a lot more than you need to, as, as you would know. And once you do figure a couple things out, you know, at least you've got a much better starting point. But I still would argue minimizing over time, you know, use the cloud for what the cloud really needs to be used for. It could be really easy to get sucked into just putting everything up there. And suddenly if you find a bill that's, uh, that escalates substantially versus the cost of, well, having better control over your own data, even having your data in multiple local points that are being replicated using the cloud. And I've, I've learned that lesson as of lately, Larry. Once Apple learned, Apple, uh, well, no, AWS launched um, Mac Mini instances, and I spun up an instance, and uh, that bill, <laughs> the bill hurt. You know, so anyone that's out there that's thinking about leave it to the developers to pay that price because don't don't spin up any AWS Mac Mini instances. It, it will cost you. So look, we have over ten minutes left, Larry. Um, I wanted to kind of segue away from the tech. You you have been busy embracing what is the climate. Obviously, COVID is a big con uh, concern for you. Um, Tell me a little bit about the, um, the, the film that you, it's, it's been out now for a few months. Also, as a company, again, you're, you're green because you have a, you, solar wind is important, uh, solar overall. How is OWC, how is Larry 
because I see I see the Larry out there that's embracing and thinking about the climate and thinking about where we go as it relates to COVID and just humanity. What is what is Larry, what is Larry's thinking about wh where you want to be as a company, as an individual in supporting the climate, making sure the climate is OK? You know, I, I grew up in the country and, uh, you know, working for my dad, he was in the paper industry, I actually dealt with a lot of recycled paper. And that was something you know, I was really I learned a lot about and was near to uh, in my youth. But, you know, respect for nature, you know, being, you know, using uh, finite resources, you know, with the best possible conservation. Those are things that you know, were ingrained pretty early. And OWC, way before, you know, green became a, a thing, you know, we were recycling. And that was, I mean, that was just, you know, knowledge and, you know, I mean, you know we got a baler to, to eliminate waste going into the uh, into landfills. I mean, we early on, uh, you know, really cut down and virtually eliminated, you know, need to have garbage pickups because just about everything that we were dealing with, you know, could be recycled and, and put to, to reuse. You know, when we built our campus, you know, which opened in 2008 in Woodstock, you know, that was a facility that we chose to build, you know, to the best you know, efficiency standards possible and achieve lead platinum with, you know, wind on site, along with geothermal for its heating and cooling, which has been around for a long time and is amazingly efficient. You know, we use pavers, you know, for our parking lot so that you know, we didn't have to have a retention pond. It, it conserves land and it also prevents, you know, the accumulation of, you know, how to say uh, toxic chemicals and such that unfortunately typically come out of cars. But you have a bio bed beneath these pavers, it's just limestone. I mean, it's not high technology. It's just smart implementation and you have a bio bed that breaks down that stuff and rather than having to have a place where it accumulates and ultimately has high toxicity. Now, we got involved with Kiss the Ground because this was something that, you know, doom, like I've always you know, been a proponent. You can look back at newsletters that I wrote, I used to write a, I thought, write a pretty good newsletter, you know, 15, you know, until probably about maybe 12 years ago, I had a regular Peace and out, but always talked about conservation and maximizing our resource use, and have been really against you know plastic water bottles just because of the waste. And you know certainly you know this customer you can get these off our website. We've been giving away during Christmas. You know water is great. Water you know reusable water bottles all the way. But going to kiss the ground, that you was know, really eye opening and really positive on you know the impact that farming has and what we can do with farming and choices we make in terms of where our food comes from. And, you know, the regenerative farming versus traditional farming that's you know, regenerative farming, bring, bringing back uh, life to land as opposed to a traditional farming that uh, you don't have to. There's no the really argument about it. You know, it's taken more every year. It takes more and more inputs to get the same uh, amount of you know, call it the produce output just because the, the land is dependent. You're dependent on fertilizers rather than the natural processes they use to keep the land healthy. And, and the worst part is we lose topsoil. You know, we have, we put CO2 up and we have the, the best CO2 sequestration system in the world you now is provided by nature and, and plant life. And it's, I really enjoyed, you know, we got to become involved with uh, Kiss the Ground and help uh, bring it about. I think Woody Harrison did a, an amazing job narrating that, that whole piece. I mean, all the, the people in that film provide a lot of good information and give hope to everybody as well. But at the end of the day, it, it was really interesting to, to understand you know, how I grew up, how I you know, thought we had to farm. I mean, like we had an even garden as opposed to, you know, a better way that you know, not only you know, is healthier for, you know, what we're eating, you know, protects water and has the potential, not just the potential, absolutely does regenerate the ground and result in a greater uh, sequestration of CO2. Now we can stop producing CO2, but that doesn't fix what's in the atmosphere. And you know, ultimately, you know, we're carbon-based life forms, plants, you know, plant life is carbon-based. You know, that CO2 can be put to good use. We just have to you know, stop you know, with some of the uh, traditional stuff that we're doing. You now, I gave up. I actually went pescatarian a couple of years ago. For Actually, I found it was good for health and everything else, but it's also you know, a positive scene that we don't necessarily have to eliminate we don't have to eliminate you know, all the meat that's out there. It's, it's, it's probably a good thing. It is one of the most expensive environmentally uh, you know, costly uh, you know, means of, how to say, of, of sustenance, I, I, there's just I can go in a thousand different directions. I didn't know. Yeah, you, know, you look at the Brazil. Ninety six percent of their soy production goes to feed cattle, and the cattle are isolated uh, from the. Uh, they're, you know, they're on separate, uh, on separate land than where the the feed is grown. You know, regeneratively speaking, at the interface, the the animals with the uh, with where the produce is with the fields, 
you know, or pasture land is actually on that CO2 uh, sequester. It's actually positive in terms of the, the uh, how do you say, the, the gases the, that, that, are, that are produced versus trapped. I mean, way before we were here, you know, things seem to have been in balance. And, it's, and there's plant life as well as animal life. And it's pretty interesting to see how the things that we can do to, to, to make things better for tomorrow. I mean, I got involved with OWC. You know, one thing, I, and even before I had kids, you know, my thought was I certainly want to you know, leave things you know, better than I found them. You know, it, it, however, I could, however, that would be possible. And that's you know, not producing products that you know, plan obsolescence, not you know, trying to force people to replace what they already have, you know, building things that last and, and doing so in the most well, you say, conservational uh, you know, process possible. So, you know, whether it's our, our building operation, you know, the appliance, we try to build technology that lasts, that, you know, helps people get more from what they already have, as well as using technology so that our own impact is minimized as much as possible. And getting involved with Kiss the Ground, which, you know, watching that is much better than me talking about it. All right. It's, it was really uh, just interesting to see what's out there. I mean, it's, you know, I believe everybody can make a difference. You know, everything does add up. I mean, every choice you make, I mean, ultimately, if everybody starts making those choices, the impact is huge. The influence is you know, incredible. And you know, there's absolutely lots that we can do today that are very practical and reasonable that will make a big difference for tomorrow. I mean, doom and gloom, I, you know, I think the response to some of the doom and the gloom is you know, either you know, folks disconnect and go, well, why bother? Because I can't do anything about it anyway. Or, you know, the, the other extreme, I mean, it, you know, they, you, know you, I get, you, you assume that you have the radical changes have to be made, that it's you know, only this technology or that solution is, is going to fix the world. And there are solutions that are practical and manageably implementable that, you know, I think we really need to focus on. I, I think some of it, I don't know. I, I just look at some of the folks that have made gains and benefited from you know, the push to green over the years and the companies out there with these zine dollar, you know, solutions that are incredibly costly and, and difficult to implement as opposed to stuff that is practical that we can do and, and will make a difference. Excellent. Um, Kiss the Ground is actually available on Netflix for those who wanted to see it. Um, Larry, it's always a pleasure um, having you on and just chatting with you and definitely want to thank you for always supporting DDC. I know um, you'll support us again in 2021, so we really appreciate that. And we're looking forward to um, having more of these live streams and talking to industry professionals. And OWC is going to allow that to happen. We can't meet in per person for DDC right now, so the web is the next, um, how are we going to do this? And, you know, I've spent a lot of time in my work, in the industry that I work with, with my business. Uh, I wouldn't say perfecting the live streaming, but I'm at a place right now where I could do a lot more of these. Um, I'm kind of a perfectionist a little bit, so I, I've always been, let me not do it until it's ready. So I, I think I'm ready now to really do these, you know, because, you know, who wants to fail at doing something, right? So Larry, um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to wrap this up, but don't go nowhere. I'm, I'm going to come back to you in the green room, okay? Sounds good, George. So thank you all for watching DDC Live. Um, I hope you all stay safe, please. Um, until we could see each other in person, hopefully next summer. Um, enjoy Christmas, have a good new year. And I look forward to chatting with all of you in the new year. And um, hopefully um, vaccine is right around the corner and we'll be able to all get vaccinated. And again, please stay safe out there.